On this episode, we take a look at some situations that turn life in Bangkok decisively in your favor. So if you want an idea of some life hacks that make living in Bangkok that much easier, you'll dig this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee Krap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 who once got killed in a movie, but was yelled at because I kept turning my head to smell the sweet, sweet fake blood, which is mostly made of glucose syrup. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Delicious. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 23 years ago and made a vow early on to learn the full name of Bangkok by heart. And I'm still working on it, so I've never left. I believe I also made a very public promise on this very podcast, Edward, to do the same <laughs> thing a few years ago, which I've spectacularly failed to do. I wonder how many, uh, obviously, there's a fair number of Thai people who can do it, but I, sh I should ask my students, what's your guess? If I asked you know, a class of you know, 30, you know, 20-year-old Thai people, if I asked them how many of them can know the full name of mm. Bangkok, what do you think? Are you, do, what do you think it is, 50%? I'm going to say 65. Okay. So it's a pretty specific guess there. <laughs> I think a lot of them probably, it's probably drilled into them at a very young age. Oh, that's a good question. All right. I'll do that. I, I will ask. I think it's going to be, I don't know what it is, but I, I feel like it's going to be fewer or less than we think. I'm going to go less than 50% can actually do it, like do, do the full name. Did you know Canada's what? original name was supposed to be the... Uh, the Commonwealth of National Dependence, the CND. And then they looked at it and they were like, C-A-N-A-D-A. <laughs> Canadian humor. What, what can we say? <laughs> all right. We want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get every episode a day early, behind the scenes photos of our interviews, a heads up to send questions to upcoming guests, and access to our Discord server, to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about a new rite of passage for Greg's son as he learned all about Mortal Kombat, the difficulties of dealing with AI in the classroom as students get more adept at using it for an assist, the controversy over tourists who choose to sunbathe near temples, and more tales of woe from Thailand's desperate pursuit of soft power. To learn how to become a patron and get all this good stuff, plus full access to over 700 bonus and regular back episodes, click the support button at the top of our website. I should also mention that in, in, in writing, it's very clear that I'm talking about Mortal Kombat with a K, the video game. It's not like I'm taking my son out back and wailing on him to teach him how to fight or something like that. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> yeah, it's clear in writing, maybe not just in, in audio only. <laughs> You're not teaching your son how to be an assassin. Not yet. As always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we can play on the show. Alrighty, well, on this episode, because Ed and I are such cheery and optimistic guys, we yep. wanted to take some time to think about all the good things about living in Bangkok. Now, sure, there are times when the city just holds you down and chokes you into submission, but there are also times when you find yourself in a situation that is so unbelievably positive, so marvelously winning, that you almost can't believe how lucky you are. Now, we're not talking about things like winning the lottery or the time of year when Cadbury cream eggs are sold at Villa, but rather... Those times when a situation appears that is so decisively in your favor that it makes life in Bangkok not just more enjoyable, but significantly easier, more secure, or just plain fun. So Ed, we, uh, we were brainstorming some ideas and we came up with this because uh, there are those Bangkok wins that all of us should celebrate. And I think this is a fun, a fun discussion. Yeah, um, and this applies mostly to uh, expats as opposed to tourists. So this is just the kind of thing, when something goes right, I mean, it could be pure luck or it could be by design, like you you got your act together and made a good decision about something. But I would, call, I would, I would call these things just when you feel like you've scored, like you, you've kind of, they, they might seem like small things at first, 
But these are things that just significantly improve your quality of life as an expat. Like if you can, if you can get one of these or do one of these things, it genuinely makes your life easier. Right. Now, like, like you said, there's tons of little things too. Like, oh, I finally found a, a, a cheap apartment or, you know, I right. got a nice girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. Like those things everyone can appreciate. But these things like really up your quality of life in Bangkok. Yeah, maybe more than you would think. So we're, we're trying to find things that uh, are not as obvious as just, oh, I got a good job. You know, right. not, not, not that kind of obvious. That's right. So we got six things here. We're just going to go through the list. And uh, you want me to go first, Ed? Sure. Well, actually, let, let me go first because the first one kind of applies to me. Okay. Um, uh, I think getting uh, an apartment or a condo or wherever that is close to where you live and having a short, convenient commute, it is improves your life so much i mean I, I think it's common sense i don't think anyone likes a long commute but man in bangkok i feel like long commutes are just it's just deadly man just yeah. deadly yeah i think i think in any city this is a good thing but in bangkok it it can make a significant difference to the quality of your life here man you know? i you know i i you know when i was back uh, home you know I, I live on the east side of cleveland it's so much easier to go long distances. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, when, you know, when uh, I was hanging out with my sister and she wanted to get, get lunch somewhere, my initial impression was, you know, that's way too far away. And she was like, what are you talking about? You know, we just pop in the car, hop on the highway, zip, zip. And, you know, you know, in 20 minutes we've gone, you know, I don't know how far, but it's just, and you just can't do that in Bangkok. And so if, if you, uh, and th- th- this, th- this win is kind of near and dear to my heart because I lived on Rochita uh, for about five years, so near Fortune Town, and I commuted to my university, which is on the river, mm-hmm. and it was uh, uh, roughly an hour each way. So oh, you know, an okay. hour in, an hour in the morning, an hour back, and I did that for five years. This is when you lived up near Fortune Town. That's right. I right. did that for five years, going to my university, and you know, it was just brutal. And then finally, when my wife and I decided to move over the river, so we're much closer to the university, it will, it's 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 more than a breath of fresh air. I don't even know what it's just. It's 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 like your life is completely different. Yeah, you know, like it, like being fifteen minutes from work as opposed to an hour. It, it doesn't seem like it would be that big a deal, but it's it's t- to me it was just life changing, and I'll never live far away from work again. Like but I've, it's an I've, hour I've, on a good day, right? Like you know, when it's raining. Oh, it could or... be worse, of course. That's right. It could, yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. So yeah. I would say every day, maybe in the best day, it might be forty-five minutes, and I was I would say it was typically an hour, and then of course, yeah, on, on like a horrible day or worse situation, it could be an hour and a half, and um, you know, you get used to it. I mean, I, there's different ways I did it. I mean, I often took taxis, you know, um, but we owned a car. But the bottom line is, I, I mean. This is the thing that matters more than you would think. Yeah, just right. being being close to work, and uh, so I, I just made a vow, like I'll I'll just never live far away from my work again in Bangkok. It's just yeah. it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I had a similar situation. I lived uh, at the end of Tong Law on Petbury. I and remember. I used to teach up at when, when my first job here. I was teaching at Bangrabu, which is up in on um, on Samsan Road, uh, also on the river, but quite far, far up. But that's that's pretty far away. Dude, it yeah. took me, like, I got on a motorcycle taxi. I took the motorcycle taxi to the BTS. Took the BTS all the way down to Ratchatui Station. At uh, Ratchatui Station, I got on a bus, and then I took the bus all the way up oh, to Bangkabu. It took about an hour and 15 minutes each way. And just doing it every day, both ways, it's just, it and, just grinds you down, man. Yeah, and I was living on Tong La, and I just, it never even occurred to me that I could move closer to, to work. Right. Because that right. was where I was. That was where I was based, and that was what I was familiar with. I was a bit timid in my early days. But now I look back and I'm like, idiot, like you're, you would have been so much better. And I would have lived in a cooler, more interesting place closer to work. Like it's just a game changer. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think people in the States, uh, you know, no one likes a long commute, but here I just, I just feel like it's worse. Yeah. It's just worse. (laughs) Something about it kills you. It's just worse. All right, go ahead. So the next one is, uh, can make your life significantly better, also significantly cheaper. And this is your spouse uh, is working at a hospital or an international school. Ooh, I like this one. Yeah. I like this one. So this is, um, yeah, the advantage of having a, a Thai spouse that works at a place that, that that 
somehow makes things cheaper for you. So yeah, like if, <laughs> if like like in you know because if they're at a hospital, you might get some, a, a deal on uh, medical costs. If they work in a school, you might get reduced tuition fees. Right. So so gen- generally speaking, if you work at a hospital, then family members get a significant discount, sometimes like fifty percent on. On everything, on everything from like a doctor's visit or major surgery, you know, which could save you tens or hundreds of thousands. Oh, of that's God. sweet. That is sweet, dude. Yeah, and uh, if it is, if you're talking about an international school, again, generally speaking, kids of teachers go to an international school for free. So if you if you don't have kids, obviously this doesn't apply to you. But if you do, you can be saving a, a oh, ton of money. Every oh, that's year. incredible. Yeah. I mean that 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 would be a coup. Like if you you know if your if your wife happened to be a teacher at an international school and it meant your kids got tuition, that that's that's huge. That's insane. Some of the international schools here are six hundred, nine hundred, a million baht a year. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, for tu- for tuition, and that's money in the bank if you're yeah. happen to be working at school. I mean, this fits the purpose of the show because if I if I met an expat here who who told me yeah my Thai wife you know works at NIST and you know we get free tuition I, I would just be like you scored dude that's yeah, that's huge exactly exactly or I gotta <laughs> gotta go in and get uh you know a boob job I get 50 percent off or something like that actually I don't know if it applies for elective surgery but um still though if you if you have to have a major something done that that sure. could be a significant load off and huge it's nice to huge. have that it's like an extra level of insurance so the moral of the story is when you're dating just ask people where they work first. And if they don't work at some place that helps you, just you know, say goodbye. Say, thanks for your time. Moving on. <laughs> Sorry. I got to find someone who works. I need to find someone who works at an international school. <laughs> I've got a cough. I need to find someone who works at a hospital. <laughs> All right, what's next? Um, this is huge, too, because I've worked, uh, I've lived in different neighborhoods. So the third one is living in a place that does not flood. Uh, it Again, if you've always lived in a place that doesn't flood, of course, you you don't appreciate what you have. But I've lived in both because I lived on Soy 1 for five years. And right. Soy 1 used to flood fairly regularly. I mean, obviously, during the rainy season, not all year. And it's just a pain in the ass. Like, just to get in and out of the soy, uh, I used to have to uh, uh, I used to have to take off my shoes and socks, put on my flip-flops, roll my pant legs up, Ugh. and then and then kind of semi-wade all the way down the soy and then you know put the shoes back on uh and then um i have actually had my first floor flood you know during the rainy season so it's not even just flooding outside like if you live on the ground floor and you're in the wrong neighborhood like your apartment might flood yeah exactly so it's it's double whammy right it's either your apartment floods which is bad enough and even if it doesn't if you're like on an upper floor then your soy can flood and you and it just it's a, just a shit way to start your day with your dirty wading in dirty water with floating dead rats and who, who knows what else you know <laughs> when right. i lived in in taladnoi close to chinatown there like i lived on like it, it felt like i lived on a pitcher's mound and uh, when it rained a lot my entire area around my building would flood but the, the parking lot and downstairs in my building was fine but i couldn't leave and we're talking oh, like mid shin right so yeah and, yeah yeah Unless you're like, it's just, it's just a terrible way to start the day, wading through dirty water on your way to work. For sure. And um, I'm really lucky now that my place, the soy, even though I live close to the river, for some reason, good water management, I guess, it just never floods, which is really nice, nice. to not have to worry about. Yeah. Where I'm at now, where I'm at now, I haven't had a problem. Uh, I've been pretty lucky. But this is the kind of thing that, you know, as a new expat, when you pick a neighborhood, it's not a thing you normally would be thinking of but right. you know a, 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 as you gain some wisdom and you move to an area like it's really helpful to ask people around there like does it flood or not it makes a difference it sure does yeah yeah and uh, we all called in sick to work but sometimes you just have to call in wet sorry i'm stuck <laughs> that's right that's right yeah floods yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> what else you got okay this one is uh, something that i've taken particular advantage of uh, uh, in my earlier days uh don't have this I don't have access to this anymore, which is a bit of a shame, but it's if you have a friend who works at an embassy, specifically the U.S. embassy. <laughs> this is classic, man. Uh, I, I know where you're going. I know where you're going with this, but why? So why is that so helpful? Well, I think I think this applies to a lot of embassies, but let's just choose a U.S. embassy in particular here for two particular reasons. First of all, the U.S. embassy has a fairly well-stocked commissary. 
Uh, Correct. With all of the delicious, fattening, sugar-filled American snacks yep. that people who live in North America are so used to at cheap prices that you can't get in most stores in Thailand. So it's nice to be able to walk in there and just load up a bag full of Pop-Tarts and you know, That's right. cinnamon toast crunch and stuff like that and not drop a thousand bucks. Yeah, I don't know what exactly the deal is. It's somehow duty-free or import tax-free or I don't know what it is. But uh, the commissary at the U.S. Embassy is is very, very good. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. It's very good and it's very cheap. Right. Now, the second reason and the one that I took most advantage of was that I'm not sure if you know this, but if you get something shipped to a U.S. Embassy address from Amazon, say, in America, you pay domestic shipping prices. They don't consider it an overseas de- destination. Oh, I didn't know that. I've never, I've never done that. Yeah, so if you just put in a special code, I forget what it is, but if you put in a code on the thing, it's like you're sending it to California. Um, so you, so essentially you had a friend at the embassy and then you would send something to him or her is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I'd, just, I'd send the URL over to them and they'd order it from Amazon and then it would show up like, nice. you know, like a week later and it would be no no shipping charges on top of it. It was huge. That's a good friend you had. Yeah, it was. And, you know, this is also probably a bit less applicable now because we've got much more access to things. But, you know, this was 10 years ago when you couldn't get a lot of really good things here still. There's still a lot of stuff that wasn't available. And I remember sure. when my friend was leaving the embassy. They don't work there anymore. So don't try and find out who they are and get them in trouble. But they don't work at the <laughs> embassy anymore. So when they left, I was like, you got to order like a ton of stuff. And I ordered <laughs> hundreds of dollars of stuff through oh, that's Amazon great. Yeah. and stocked up. So that's that's really cool if you can do that. I wonder if this is still true. That that, that That's an interesting question. We'll have to figure that out. Um, but in general, it's a good idea to have someone at the embassy. It's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, I'm kidding. Like I always say in Bangkok, you don't so much make friends as you make allies. <laughs> it's good, good, good saying. All right, what's next? Well, I mean, this again, uh, it might seem kind of obvious, but it's in Bangkok, I think it's particularly hard to do this. And if you, if you, if you manage to score this it's it's a huge win uh finding a maid uh finding a maid that is good reliable that you get along with you like them they like you and they're willing and do stay with you long term finding a good long-term maid in bangkok it's a common problem among expats and if you just get a good one that lasts two three four five years it just it it just reduces a lot of stress in your life and solves a lot of problems. Yeah, you see these expat groups, Facebook groups, and all these other you know, sort of support groups. There's always posts, anyone know I'm made? I'm looking for this details, this many, much time, this many times a week, this much salary. That's right. You know, it's a constant, constant thing here because the turnover is so high. But yes, finding a maid who's as happy with you as you are with them, it's gold, man. It's hard. And and then someone who sticks around. I mean, I've had uh, many mates over the years. And luckily, some of them have stayed for a few years. Um, but I, I would say maybe the longest uh, me and my wife managed was probably about three years, uh, which, you know, which is not bad as things go. Uh, but man, it's so disruptive when you're used to someone and then they leave for a reason and then you have to find someone else. Um it's, it's always a little bit weird having a new person in your house. You don't yeah. know who they are. Uh, there's language difficulty. You don't know if you can trust them. There's kind of a probation period. Uh, and a lot of, you know, the, a lot of them, uh, uh, you know, like you said, the turnover rate is high. So a lot of them quit after two months. So just because you find someone you like, it doesn't mean they're going to stay. So you, you don't really know if they're going to be long term until maybe after six months. Right. And a lot of the times they'll just up and disappear. Like, hey, where maid didn't come today. Straight up. And then you call them and they don't pick up. And that's the last time you ever see them. You're like, I hope they're okay. <laughs> that happened to my wife and I uh, with a maid that we had for three years. She just really? three disappeared. Three years. Three years. She just disappeared, uh, stopped answering her phone. We have no idea why. Like, she didn't take anything or steal anything. She was very well paid. Uh, I th- I'm guessing it had something to do with her. She obviously wanted to leave, but maybe she felt bad about it or felt shy yeah. about it and, and so just bailed. But it's very disruptive and frustrating and annoying. So, man, if you have a good maid, long-term, you win. 
<laughs> That's right. You win Bangkok. It's a bit you of a win. first world problem too, though, isn't it? Like, oh, my maid is gone. But like you said, it, 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 it you can sound a bit whiny, but it's not just that you don't have a maid. It's just that the, 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 the routines that you've built up are suddenly thrown into disarray. Yes, it, it can be very for disruptive. Sure. For sure. I mean, in a way, it's, it, I guess it is a first world problem, but maids overall are not that expensive in Bangkok. So, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I would never have a maid in the States, you know, it's just, but no. it is something, it's something that I feel like I need here and I can afford it. It's just finding a good one who sticks around. Do you ever feel the need to clean up a little bit before your maid comes? Well, yeah. I mean, I think everyone does. Like, I'm like, I'm like okay, yeah. I don't, I don't want, to, I don't want them to see, see me at my worst, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Like they can't see the real me. I've got to put on some sort of a mask. That's right. Of course. Of course. Obviously. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do we got? We, I think we got one more. One more. Yeah, one more. Uh, and this is something that is uh, important for people who are going to work here. But I'm surprised at how many people still don't get this when they come to live here. And that is finding a job that is very upfront and honest and offers you a work permit. Oh, man, this is huge. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, it, you know. Obviously, if you're working for a big proper corporation, or you got your, you secured your job from the U.S. or Canada or Europe, you probably do have a work permit. But both you and I know tons of people who've lived here for many years, and they're constantly fighting to get a work permit, or they get a work permit for a year, and then their company says, "Oh, we can't do it for next year," or uh, right. you, you're forced, you're forced to work on a tourist visa. It a work permit is is gold man it's gold yeah. uh especially when you don't have to worry about it and the company just takes care of it and it's kind of a guaranteed thing it's 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 a bit of a achievement it's like an achievement unlocked yeah i think you're right i think if, if you're in a position here where that's never been an issue you might not know just how desperate the struggle is for people who correct. don't have that option correct um, my first god my first six years here I didn't have a work permit and oh really yeah i was working under the exactly. table like, like so many people do and it, it sucked i was always looking over my shoulder i remember one job i had every once in a while the revenue department would come by just to make sure they weren't um they were like the, the, i don't know where they were checking chicken there's no no people like me there i guess but there was more than once where i had to grab my shoes and run upstairs into the like, oh really the, like one of the bedrooms of someone who lived upstairs and like hide and there was, a oh, whole, geez. Oh, geez. there was a whole thing worked out. Like if they bust in, then you're just a friend of someone and you're hanging out, you know, it's, it's no way to live here. That's right. I mean, like, like you said, a lot of people who, who just stumbled into a work permit, a lot of people, a lot of expats think, oh, it's just normal. Like everyone gets an, a work permit, but that is not true. Like, no. I know people who, I know people who make really good money here uh, and they still, don't they don't have a regular work permit like they might get one for a while or they lose it or they switch companies and it never gets transferred over um man so if, if you and you know you and i both know a lot of teachers and i would say teachers are the number one group of people who get screwed over on this you know so right. they get they get offered a job the salary is okay everything seems fine and then you know they show up and it's like yeah yeah we can't get your work permit yeah what, what that basically is is like sorry you're gonna have to kind of live with one eye open all the time and figure out a way right. to sort of slalom your way through the legal right barriers in thailand and hope you don't get caught good luck it hurts your job security you, obviously you, you can't get a a, a a a proper visa you might have to be on a tourist visa if you don't have the work permit right so it's just it's just like a cascading set of problems but man it's true for, of a lot of work so so i know out there you guys are listening, you, like you expats out there. You guys know exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, uh, uh, work permits, uh, they are gold. Um, yeah. Actually, we could almost call this show gold because if, if you can manage to get like all of these things we've talked about, like you you win. Gold, Jerry, gold. So yeah, it's, it's something that a lot of people have to struggle with. I'm still surprised how many people have to deal with it. And I'm also surprised how many people just assume that's the way that things are. But right. I mean, you know, so these, th yeah, so all of these things, um, it, you, some of them you might not have that much control over, but I guess our lesson we're trying to say out there to expats, especially new, new or younger expats, these are the things you should be at least trying to get. You should be thinking about. So yeah. you should be, you should not be thinking of, oh, I can handle a commute like I would back home. No, you can't. Like, <laughs> you should, <laughs> yeah. you know, you should, you should plan it 
like change where you live. And if you're a teacher and you go to a place that looks really cool, just tell them, I'm not working here if you don't get me a work permit. You know, so I mean, it's right. something that you can't, because I think, again, you get these new teachers that don't realize how hard their life's going to be without a work permit. So mm-hmm. they look at the salary, they look at the package, they're like, cool. And then they're like, oh, yeah, they told me they couldn't get me a work permit. And they don't realize that that's just going to cause so many other problems. Yeah. Then you find yourself battling beggars in Aranya Pratet while you wait at some skeezy that's right. casino for some random dude to come by with, with your passport. Yeah. So these are all things, I, I guess the lesson is these are all things that you should try to work and try to be strategic about. And of course, there's some luck involved. You can't control all these things. But uh, these are, if you can control these things, you should. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. So um, I say uh, three out of six, you're doing well. Four out of six, not bad. Five out of six, six out of six. Score. Gold. Score. No doubt. No doubt. Gold. All right. Let's do something that we call love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we discuss to decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with, no matter how we feel about it. This week, Ed, I'm on the hot seat. What do you got? Okay. um, So I know you have a car, um, but um, you do... uh, you do kind of normally take short motorbike rides. Is that, is that correct? Almost every day, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, my question to you is about this. I, I, I think there's a big, like short motorbike rides are definitely convenient and relatively safe. But my question to you is, what's your take on the long motorbike ride? Like the 30, the 30 or 40 minute thing. So imagine if there's just massive traffic jams or it's some special event and you know it, you, you know it's going to take an hour and a half or 30 minutes but it's going to be a long motorbike ride and you know and that might involve uh, occasionally things at high speed maybe going over one of the bridges on a motorbike i feel like these long motorbike rides are totally different than the, than the quick super safe ones are you someone who just avoids the long motorbike rides like a plague or are you like I, I have, I have a buddy who loves them. He, it's like the greatest thing. It's like he's got like a cheat code to to get across Bangkok. <laughs> so, what's uh, your take on the long motorbike ride? I, I, I love that they're available, and I have done them many times, but I would prefer not to. So, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to say I'll, I'll live with them, but only because I, I, I don't love them because I'd rather just take a taxi. But I love that they exist. I remember one time when when my son was first born, um, he was staying at my wife's family's condo up on Lad Prow 101, which is like way up north. Oh, yeah, sure. And right, I'm living yeah, yeah. on Cherenikon. And I took a motorcycle. It was just like it, it was like 4.30 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, and I just had to get there. Oh, geez. And so I just got a motorcycle. I'm like, Lad Prow 101. The guy's like, what? I was like, yeah, whatever. Right, yeah. However much it's it like, is. That'll be 200. That'll be 200 baht. I'll take, yeah, but... Right. You save a lot of time doing that. Yeah, but in, in usually in those situations, the reason you're taking a motorcycle taxi that distance is because you need to save time, and it's probably worth the 200 baht. So agreed. I'm f- I'm fine with them, but I must have a helmet. Yeah, my I, I have mixed feelings. You know, I'm a little bit like you in that w- w- when you need it, and you know, let's say you're late for something, and it's on the other side of the city, and you ca- you know you're never going to be able to get there right. in a taxi because of traffic, or the SkyTrain doesn't go where you want to go. It is awesome that it exists, but man, it's terrifying. Like, like, so I, I have a very, I guess I'm going to have to say live with, I, but, but I feel like I'm, I'm a loathe because I, I, I feel like it's so stupid to be on a motorbike that long, especially when, you know, usually on a long ride, at least portions of it will be at high speed in in traffic. So I, I kind of hate myself when I do it because I think it's so irrational and so stupid to be on a motorbike for 40 minutes or something right. like that. You're, you're sitting next to a bus and you're flying down the road at 80 kilometers an hour. You're like, yeah, I'm six inches away from the wheel. That's right. And the motorbike, you know, these motorbike guys will go in between cars right. and it's just, so part of me just hates it and, and it's, it's terrifying. And I feel like this might be the last couple of minutes of my life. <laughs> right. But then on the other half, it's like you get to your destination and you're like, thank God I had this option. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, the only so thing faster I, than a motorcycle in that situation would be a helicopter. Because there's, there's right. no there's no better way to get across the city when you have to. So I got to say, I loathe it and I love it. Mm-hmm. So 
I guess that means I'm a live with. The rare, the rare love loath. So we'll settle in the middle and say live with. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so true though. I mean, I don't want to do it. Like I, like I said, I. It's just it is risky. Like motorbikes are dangerous. Like we've said it a million times. So, you know, I don't. Hopefully I won't take many of these long ones, but man, when you need that thing, when right. you need that long motorbike and it's there, it feels good in the end when, w- w- if you survive. Yeah. It, it's like insurance. It's it. I hate that I have it. I, I hate that it's there, <laughs> but I love it when I, when it's there in an emergency. For sure. For sure. Yeah. All righty. A final thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping in our never ending quest for cool content. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web or simply Bangkok podcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Totes my goats. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show. Hit me up on threads at BKK Greg. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take it easy out there and we will see you back here next week. No doubt. Hit me up on threads at BKK Greg. Thanks for listening, everyone. Take it easy out there, and we will see you back here next week. No <laughs> doubt. Oh, God. Just made it. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> yeah.